Good morning and a happy Easter. Jesus Christ is risen today. Hallelujah. It's lovely to see you all this morning. I hope you're able to get out and enjoy the day and go out and trundle your egg down the hill at some stage. Uh, so you're welcome to worship here, either in person or perhaps later on online. So you're all welcome. And I want to say particularly welcome, not to a guest, uh, but to an old friend. So I welcome George, uh, George Moore, back home to Rosemary. Uh, to give you some idea of George's connection, George was my youth leader uh, when I came to the youth club uh, 53 years ago. Uh, and George was old then, so I don't know what age he is now. <laughs> But George, can I say it is lovely to have you back in Rosemary, and thank you for leading our service this morning. There are a few announcements uh, I'd like to draw to your attention this morning. Uh, they're in your order of service, and on the screen, the services uh, for the rest of the, the month uh, into April, and to remind you particularly that next Sunday morning will be communion, uh, and Philip will be leading that for us. Then there's the note about the maintenance of property and the envelope. Uh, there's also the details of the items needed for the food bank uh, during April, particularly those items, uh, not exclusively, but particularly. Uh, and then there'll be no discipleship groups this week, uh, but they'll recommence on the 10th and the 11th. Uh, on the 10th of April as well, during the day in the afternoon, there'll be the coffee and chat and Easter reflections that day, uh, around in 3.09. Um, also, the painting group and their exhibition uh, that's running from the 30th of March right up until next Sunday, the 7th of April, if you get a chance to go up and view that. Those are all the announcements, except to tell you that the April prayer diary is available at the rear of the church, so you can maybe get that after tea and coffee. And we do hope that you'll stay for a cup of tea and coffee afterwards. Happy Easter. Thank you, George. Good morning. Uh, it's lovely to be back and to share with you in worship this morning. I brought with me the Bible this congregation presented to me when I was licensed as a probationer for the ministry and showed Trevor it's 45 years ago since I left Rosemary Church to go as Carn Mon to assistant minister in Carn Money. But it's nice to be back and to share with you today on this Easter day. Peter says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Through, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's join together in the worship of this great God as we sing together, crown him with many crowns.
Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious, eternal, loving Heavenly Father, we gather here this morning to praise and to worship you. You who in your great mercy gave us new birth into a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We rejoice in Jesus, the Lamb of God, who took upon himself the sin of the world and rose again to everlasting life and glory. We praise you for the Holy Spirit, who raises us to new life with Christ. We praise you for this day, this victorious day, this day when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It is through your mercy we can come with joy to greet the risen Christ. There's nothing in us, there's no merit in us ourselves that make us worthy of that. We stand before you as guilty sinners but in the love that radiates from Jesus' empty cross, forgive and cleanse us and lead us and bless us. Let the joy of the risen Christ reach down into us. The recollection of Christ crucified dictate our values and our thinking and our speaking. Till our actions and our attitudes are purified and Christ is reflected in us. As Jesus made himself known first at Easter to the people who most loved him and missed him, grant that he may be made known on Resurrection Day to any who feel cut off from him, any who feel that joy has gone out of their lives. As he dealt patiently with the doubts and problems of Thomas, we pray that he may deal patiently with those who are handicapped by closed minds all who fear that the resurrection news is too good to be true, all who are held back from faith by intellectual barriers of doubt, make yourself known to such and set them free. Jesus is risen indeed. May all creation shout with joy. May the gospel trumpet sound the good news. We rejoice that life and freedom have come because the Savior lives and reigns and triumphs now and throughout all ages. So we bow before the risen, triumphant Christ this day, lost in wonder, love, and praise. As it is in his name that we pray. Amen. We're going to read together from Matthew's Gospel, the 28th chapter, Matthew's account of the resurrection. Matthew chapter 28, and page 44 in the Pew Bible. Matthew chapter 28, we read at verse 1. Let us attend together to the Word of God. After the Sabbath, a Sunday morning was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake. An angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled the stone away, and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid that they trembled and became like dead men. The angel spoke to the women. You must not be afraid, he said. I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has been raised, just as he said. Come here and see the place where he was lying. Go quickly now and tell his disciples he has been raised from death, and now he is going to Galilee ahead of you. There you will see him. Remember what I have told you. So they left the tomb in a hurry, afraid, and yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. 
Suddenly, Jesus met with them and said, Peace be with you. They came up to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Do not be afraid, Jesus said to them. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While the women went on their way, some of the soldiers guarding the tomb went back to the, into the city and told the chief priests everything that had happened. The chief priests met with the elders and made their plan. They gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, You are to say that his disciples came during the night and stole his body while you were asleep. And if the governor should hear of this, we will convince him that you are innocent and you will have nothing to worry about. The guards took the money and did what they were told. And so that is the report spread around by the Jews to this very day. The eleven disciples went to the hill in Galilee where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, even though some of them doubted. Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I will be with you always to the end of the age. Amen. And God bless to our hearts and to our minds the very reading of his own word for Christ's sake. Let's join again as we sing praise, singing, See What a Morning, Gloriously Bright.
going to unite together in a prayer for others. Let us pray. Father, on this glorious day of Easter, give us and all your people a vision of our world as your love would make it. A world where the weak are protected and none goes hungry or poor. A world where the benefits of civilized life are shared and everyone can enjoy them. A world where different nations, races, and cultures live with tolerance and mutual respect. A world where peace is built with justice and where justice is guided by love. And give us the courage and inspiration to help to build such a world. Make us open channels of your love, of your healing, and of your restoration. Our gracious God, we ask you today to have mercy on our country where policies, laws, and a change of culture have contributed to bringing poverty, health problems, and family hardship to many people. Please raise up more men and women of wisdom, integrity, and faith to be leaders on every sphere of public life. We intercede today for adults and children who have become addicted to gambling, to alcohol, to drugs. Please help them to find the support that they need. Help us to deal with the underlying problems that we face day by day. Father, we pray today for a world in turmoil. We pray for the situation in Israel and Gaza, for the situation in Ukraine, the situation in Sudan and Yemen, and other troubled spots in our world. We pray particularly for all those who are living in daily fear of meeting with violence, having their homes destroyed, suffering death, and for those who are injured, displaced, or grieving the loss of loved ones. We pray for the groups and the agencies working to bring relief aid to those most in need that their efforts will succeed despite the very complex situation on the ground and significant logistical challenges they face. We pray for every effort of those who are seeking to bring peace in our troubled world, believing that nothing is impossible for our God, the one who is sovereign and rules over all the nations of the world. We pray, O oh God, as we pray for the world in which we live, we pray for our own province. We pray for that the events of the last couple of days will not destabilize the political institutions in our province. We pray that the executive will continue to seek to develop the many needs in our community. We pray that you will just overrule in the whole political situation in our province at this critical time. We lift up before you Catherine, Princess of Wales, and King Charles as they face their diagnosis. We ask for your divine healing touch to be upon them, bringing restoration and wholeness to their bodies. Grant them strength, courage, and perseverance as they navigate through this challenging time. Surround them with your love, your comfort, and your peace, knowing that you are with them every step of the way. We lift up before you the entire royal family, asking for your grace to sustain them and unite them in love and support for one another. Strengthen their bonds and grant them resilience in the face of adversity. And we pray for all who are suffering, all who are suffering illness, all who are suffering hardship. 
We pray for those known to us who are ill at this time, and we uplift them before you. And we pray that you will bring to them your strength and your healing touch, that you will undertake for them and bless them in their struggles. For these are prayers we ask in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. We're going to sing praise again. We're going to sing what has become a well-known and and, uh, popular modern hymn, In Christ Alone My Hope Is Found. He is my light, my strength, my song. I've just been given an accoutrement, which I hope I'll be able to use. Uh, So as we go through, um, I hope I remember how to change the different slides. The best attested fact in history. That's the well-known description of the resurrection of Jesus, which was first used by Matthew Arnold. 
The phrase is probably an exaggeration, but every Christian should know and should be immeasurably strengthened and encouraged in their Christian conviction by knowing how well attested the resurrection is. The New Testament is full of the resurrection. The resurrection is basic to the Christian faith. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, said this, Now, since our message is that Christ has been raised from death, how can some of you say the dead will not be raised to life? If that is true, it means that Christ was not raised. And if Christ has not been raised from death, then we shall we have nothing to preach, and you have nothing to believe. Paul says, if the resurrection did not take place, then we have no faith to believe in. We have no Lord to save us. We have no hope for this life or the life to come. The risen Christ promises newness of life, He promises eternal life if we trust in Him. But if He is not raised, then all those promises are in vain. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then the full promises of the gospel do not exist. But if Jesus did rise from the dead, then the full promises of the gospel are ours for the taking. Such was the newness of life brought to the first Christians by Jesus that they could only indicate its wonder by stating that they had, been di- they had died and risen with Christ. Old things had passed away. New things had come. The risen Christ triumphed over death and promises eternal life to those who commit their lives to him. The Bible affirms that Jesus rose from the dead, and this is the gospel we share. And at this Easter morning service, we want to turn to Matthew's account of the resurrection. In chapter 28 of Matthew, verse 6, we read, He is not here. He has been raised. These words transformed the lives of the early disciples. They can transform our lives as well. The disciples had been a straggly group of erratic and fickle failures, doubting, denying. But because of the power of the risen Christ, they turned into a dynamic fellowship of bold, unselfish pioneers. And that transforming life that Jesus brings can be ours as it was to the 11 disciples. So let's learn some lessons from the 28th chapter of Matthew. First of all, I want us to focus on the certainty of the resurrection, the certainty of the resurrection. Matthew's account of the resurrection, ha, resurrection happenings on Easter Day is prefaced by two important little incidents which took place late on the first Good Friday and on Easter Saturday. The first concerns the burial of Christ, and the second concerns the securing of the tomb. In both these incidents, Pontius Pilate figured prominently It was he who gave Joseph of Arimathea permission to remove Christ's body from the cross. And it was he who gave permission to the priests to secure the tomb. The reason for this emphasis is that the burial of Christ's body proved the reality of his death, while the securing of the tomb proved the reality of the resurrection. First of all, the burial of the body. Once death had claimed the victims of the grim torture of crucifixion, their bodies were generally left on the cross to decay. 
But in this instance, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, the ruling council, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus up to this point, now boldly goes to Pilate and asks, could he remove the Lord's body? Pilate, surprised that Jesus was already dead, gave leave for Joseph to take the body. Another member of the Jewish council, one Nicodemus, whom we had met in John chapter 3, came with Joseph, and Nicodemus had brought spices, and the two men together climbed the hill called Golgotha, tenderly lifted the body from the cross, wrapped it in clean linen cloths with spices, and carried it to the garden where they laid it in Joseph's rock-hewn tomb. After which they rolled across the mouth of the tomb a great circular stone. So Jesus really died. There was no possibility of supposing that he had only fainted. Easter morning did not witness the revival of man who had swooned, but the resurrection of a man who had died and had been wrapped in grave clothes and buried. The second incident that Pilate uh, authorized was the securing of the tomb. This is a distinctive character of Matthew's account of the resurrection. He emphasizes the laying, uh, the sealing and guarding of the tomb. On the Saturday, Pontius Pilate received a deputation of chief priests and scribes and Pharisees. They had succeeded in having Jesus crucified, but they were not satisfied. They said to Pilate, Sir, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he had been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. The deception of the resurrection, they thought, would be worse than Jesus' claim to be the Messiah. Pilate was quite willing to give them permission by this stage, he was probably sick of this whole situation with Jesus. He had been bothered enough, and his conscience was now restless. Take a guard, he says. Go, make the tomb secure, as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting a guard. There was therefore no chance of any sabotage of the tomb. The tomb was sealed and guarded and inside was a cold, dead, embalmed body. Make the tomb as secure as you know how Pilate had instructed. And they did just that. They were confident that their precautions were foolproof. But they left God out of the calculation. According to Matthew, there was an earthquake. An angel with a, face, with a face like lightning and clothes like snow came, rolled away the stone, and sat on it. The guards trembled and became like dead men. One commentator puts it like this. We need not suppose that our blessed Lord needed the help of an angel when he came out of the grave. But we do not know, and I do not pretend to know, exactly how it all happened. But the facts are plain. Something supernatural took place. True, the soldiers later reported to the priests what had happened, and the priests bribed them to spread the rumor that the disciples had come and stolen the body while they were asleep. But do you not think that's pretty ridiculous? Would Roman soldiers fall asleep at their posts? If so, how did they know what had taken place? And if they were awake, were they tricked by a handful of defenseless and guileless women? No, it was the priests who were the impostors. Jesus was the mighty conqueror of death. 
These things still constitute one of the best proofs of the resurrection. The stone was rolled away. The guard was outwitted. The body had gone. The tomb was empty. Empty except for the grave clothes, which lay there undisturbed as if the body had passed through them. The very precautions that the priests had set up by guarding the tomb increased the reality of the facts that Jesus rose from the dead. The certainty of the resurrection. Secondly, there is the challenge of the resurrection. The resurrection is not just a fact to be believed. It's a challenge to be faced. If this Jesus is alive, he is a person to be reckoned with or a person that reckons with us. He is a risen Lord, crucified for our sin and rising again to give us newness of life. And he demands a response from us that we turn to him in repentance of our sin and commit our lives to him in humble faith. He is the risen Lord, and he has a right to direct our lives and to tell us where to go and what to do. The message which both the angels and Christ took, told the woman to give to the disciples was to go to Galilee. Perhaps he was anxious for their safety. Perhaps he thought that a time of withdrawal would help him to take in what had happened. Perhaps he felt that the association with olden times would strengthen them and that his new charge would best be given when they had received the old one. To Galilee they went, to the mountain he had specified, and to the rendezvous he had appointed. And there the risen Christ spoke to them, First of all, he gave them a declaration. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The risen Christ possesses all authority. He has been exalted far above every name that has been named. He has no rivals. He is supreme. And I've forgotten to move this thing on. As the hymn writer puts it, Jesus is Lord. O sin, or sin the mighty conqueror, from death he rose, and all his foes shall own his name. Jesus is Lord. God sent his Holy Spirit to show by works of power that Jesus is Lord. Do we acknowledge him as Lord? Do we bow to his authority? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. The ultimate power does not lie in the hands of politicians, and we should be thank God for that. It does not lie with world leaders. It does not lie with the forces of this world. It does not lie with the devil. Even though often we think that the forces of evil are having the upper hand, it's not the case. Jesus is Lord. His is the authority. Ultimately, everyone must stand before him in judgment. The day is coming when all the world will have to admit that he is Lord. But by then, it will be too late for some to do anything about it, and to do anything about their ultimate destiny. His is the authority. He has all authority in heaven and on earth. And he gave them a command. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. The risen Lord is Lord of the church. It is he who deploys his army and governs his people. It is he who commands them to make disciples of all nations. The mission task of the church still awaits completion because the church has not always taken the task as serious as it should. Jesus' command to us is to go and make disciples, not sit back and let people come to us. We are to go to make disciples. You are called to go and make disciples in this area where God has placed you. 
We are to make him known. Make him known where we are. Make him known with the people we mix. Make him known in the area in which God has set us. Go and make disciples, he says. And he tells them them to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is always administered in response of faith. We as Presbyterians believe that baptism is for people who become Christians who have not been baptized as infants in response to their own faith. But we baptize children in response to the profession of the faith of their parents as part of God's covenant family. Finally, Jesus commanded them to teach. Conversion and baptism are only the beginning. When we become disciples of Jesus Christ, we are beginning, embarking on a lifetime, a lifetime of learning and obeying Jesus. When the rabbis had disciples, they trained them to become rabbis. But when Jesus made disciples, they were to be disciples. It is a lifelong learning experience. It's lifelong learning of Jesus, sitting under his instruction, living for him, declaring that he is Lord. Jesus is the Lord of heaven and earth and commands his church to declare his lordship throughout the world so that people may be made disciples and may be taught to follow and obey him. And then we have the comfort of the resurrection. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. I will be with you all the time to the very end of the age. We do not just worship some figure from past history, nor do we worship some distant God who reclines on a faraway throne. We have a living Lord and an ever-present friend. At the beginning of Matthew's gospel, the angel said to Joseph, you will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And the same gospel ends with this promise, surely I will be with you always, to the very end of the age. Christmas and Easter are linked. Jesus promises to be with us always, all the time, 24-7, on work days and holidays, on Sundays and weekdays, on good days and bad days. There is no exception. He is with us all the time. And he will remain with us. If we trust our lives to him, he will remain with us to the very end. Peter Marshall was a famous chaplain in the U.S. Senate, and he wrote a book called The First Easter. And he says of the disciples, they now felt that they were still in touch with him. In a different way, yes, but in a more powerful way. They knew that he was still with them. Even as he had promised, they felt that. They knew it. The promises he had made to them before his death were now fulfilled. And they went up and down the land and across the sea and round the world, telling of Jesus and his love. They shook the Roman Empire until it tottered and fell. They changed the world. And this is a fact that in this 21st century, we cannot ignore. Throughout the 20 20 centuries which have followed Christ's resurrection, in every land there have been men and women who have experienced the same fellowship, who have felt the same power in their lives, who have experienced the same peace and inner serenity. We have had the same joy 
and the same radiant victory. And each one of us on this Easter day can have the same fellowship with the risen Christ. Our lives can be guided by Him. Our problems can be solved by His wisdom. Our weakness may be turned into strength by His help. Our sorrows may be turned into joy by His comfort. All of this we can experience if we trust Him and turn to Him and commit ourselves to Him. So at this Easter time, may the certainty of the resurrection persuade your minds to believe in Christ. May the challenge of the resurrection move our wills to live for Christ. And may the comfort of the resurrection strengthen our hearts to endure for Christ. Let us pray. Father, on this glad day, we rejoice in the reality of the resurrection. And we rejoice that Jesus promises to be with us as he sends us out to share his gospel with men and women around the world. We pray, O oh God, that you will draw near to us today, that the certainty of the resurrection will enable and strengthen us in our belief in Christ, that the challenge of the resurrection will move us to live more nearly to Christ. And may the comfort of the resurrection strengthen our hearts to endure as we live for him day by day. For we ask in his name and for his sake. Amen. Get you up there and do your work. I had a friend who taught, uh, he was prin vice principal and then principal of school in Londonderry. And he said to me, anybody I have taught, I have a psychological advantage over. Well, I have a psychological advantage over him because he was a wee boy in the youth club. <laughs> We're going to sing, close by singing, Jesus, Prince and Saviour.
And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.